Welcome everyone to our uh, post ASCO, post Arizona meeting discussion of updates in head and neck cancer. Going to start off with curable HPV positive head and neck cancer. So historically, we know that smoking was the dominant cause of head and neck cancer, followed sometimes by alcohol and in certain parts of the world, betel nut chewing. Um, I had never heard of a betel nut until I got into he uh, head and neck cancer. But at any rate, we know that in recent years, the human papillomavirus, the same virus that we know and hate for causing cervical cancer and anogenital cancer, can also cause head and neck cancer. And we've learned that the biology of these cancers, what we can expect from them, uh, is very, very different. Um, and perhaps, Dr. Patel, you could start, start us off with how these present differently and how we think about them differently. Absolutely. Thank you, Jared, for that nice summary. And as you mentioned, um, from a biological perspective and a tumor growth perspective, these cancers that are HPV related versus more smoking or other carcinogen exposure related um, have a very different biologies. Um, and we see that oftentimes the HPV associated cancers will present in patients that don't have smoking histories or extensive smoking histories. Um, they tend to be male predominant. Um, and also presenting at younger ages oftentimes. And what we've also seen is that from a disease perspective, they also behave differently. So typically speaking, the prognosis of the HPV-associated cancers has been better. And so we've tried over the years to modify our treatments to fit that different biology and to maybe adjust the treatment in patients with HPV-associated cancers to get the same high cure rates, but perhaps spare some of the toxicities that we see with our cancer treatment. That's wonderful. And that might be a great transition, maybe like a almost planted transition to asking Dr. Shah. So um, how should we treat this, these patients differently in practice? So a patient comes in, they've read on the internet about generic head and neck cancer treatment, seven weeks of radiation, um, a nasty chemotherapy called cisplatin. In your practice, um, outside of a clinical trial, what's different for the HPV-driven patient? Yeah, you know, I think the right answer is that we just don't know quite yet. I think there's so many ways to treat this cancer. And the simple truth is that um, a lot of the therapies, whether it's a combination of chemo radiation therapy or doing surgery first, it tends to work. And so we know that the data for an HPV associated cancer is better in terms of um, long term overall survival and um, response rates to these therapies. So that's a, at least a good um, problem to have. I think how we've been doing it at our institution is to give a shorter course of radiation therapy and a smaller dose of chemotherapy. But again, these are su um, supported by what we call phase two trials. So they're smaller trials that haven't really been um, randomized or pitted against the standard of care. And so unfortunately, a lot of places are doing the these types of what we call de-intensification trials or trying to give less treatment. Uh, but they really, there hasn't been an effort um, nationally until more recently of trying to ask this question. So um, one, one trial that is kind of going on is energy head and neck zero five, which I think we'll get into in a little bit, but I'll stop there. You know, I think the-, the Actually go there. I think that's a okay. really important trial and this is the natural place to talk about it. Sure. And so I think, so what this trial is doing is trying to do a collection of many different therapeutic approaches. So taking the standard of care, which is radiation, uh, 70 gray for seven weeks versus with cisplatin concurrently and, um, and doing a two, well, the initial study design was to randomize it against two different arms. One was with um, a lower dose of radiation therapy, uh, 60 gray and a smaller dose of cisplatin. And then the other dose was to try another de-intensification strategy. So instead of doing cisplatin to add an immunotherapy and um, combine that with radiation therapy. I think one of the biggest surprises, and we still haven't really seen a lot of the data, was that the lower dose of radiation therapy and cisplatin was actually shown not to be as good as the other two arms. So that arm was stopped early, and we're now waiting to see the results of the, the two ongoing randomized arms. Um, and maybe we'll get a finally an answer to this question of, can we do something different than that standard of care that we do for the more aggressive head and neck cancers? 
Thank you. That was wonderfully explained. Yeah, I think there's we're left with quandaries as patient doctor teams, right? On the one hand, um, we want to uh, decrease the uh, harm that we do from therapy, right? There's a long literature showing that we hurt people even when we cure them. Um, in terms of dry mouth and dental problems, in terms of speech problems, in terms of swallowing problems, in terms of skin problems, with the chemo kidney problems and problems with the nerves that go to the tips of fingers and toes. Um, and of course, during treatment, um, lots of mucositis, which are sores in the mouth, um, lowering of blood counts, nausea. Um, we don't like that. We don't like hurting people, despite, um, I think, the caricature of the oncologist that maybe some other specialties make. Um, and we want our cured patients to live like cured patients. But on the other hand, I think that what's easily lost in that um, well-intentioned human drive is the harm that failure to cure does to people. Um, that uh, just, just how much that can trash quality of life and of course end it. Um, and I agree, we have to, we have to find the right uh, balance um, as a field, I think people do uh, tend to round high numbers to 100 and low numbers to zero, right? We have this improvement in cure rate, but what percentage are we curing of locally advanced HPV positive head and neck cancer? A little north of 90, something like that. And I think patients hear that and they say, oh, I'm going to get cured. And unfortunately, all three of us see more than 100 of these patients a year, right? We're going to meet those 10-ish people who are, are not cured. Are there any ways um, out there in research, any good ideas on there about how to further refine that and understand who with HPV driven cancer is more likely to be cured and who less for adjudicating? You know, So there you are, we are in a clinic with a patient, right? Who's considering, do I wanna get six weeks of radiation or seven, just as an example, I think a common clinical quandary, obvious human benefits on each side. And so if you have a, a patient trying to make this kind of choice, is there anything that can help us? Well, I, I can start by, by maybe bringing up some of the research areas that are being investigated to help us answer that question. So hopefully we'll have better data in the future. Um, you know, some of the interesting areas that are being explored are, are looking at things like the level of oxygen in a patient's cancer. Um, so there's some studies that look using special radio tracers at the amount of oxygen that a patient's cancer is getting because low levels of oxygen have been associated with radiation resistance. And people are using that in a research setting to try to see if we can lower the total dose of radiation that patients with HPV-related cancers can get, still achieve high cure rates, which Dr. Weiss mentioned is really a, an important and ultimate goal here, but then also decrease some of these toxicities by lowering the radiation dose. So I think that'll be one interesting area from a research perspective in the future that we'll be hopefully seeing more data on um, that looks to be encouraging. Um, I think another interesting area is looking at gene expression signatures. So certain cancers, you look at the genes that are expressed in them, they seem to have better prognosis, even subdividing HPV cancers. Um, and so those may be research areas that we hopefully can apply in the clinic in the near future. I love it. And I would just add that, you know, for those of us, um, uh, now I was going to tease, but I won't. But you know, in the clinic, uh, if we take the fancy science out for just a moment, we also do have stage the anatomy of the cancer and smoking status that are probably surrogates for the um, better predictors. I think that you're describing that I, that I believe strongly will ultimately, but will be what we use in clinic. Yeah, and I'll I'll just add, and I think Dr. Patel really hit hit on it, but but the oxygen level in tumors, and there was a recent publication in a a major journal called the Journal of Clinical Oncology and by the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so what they did is in patients with um, HPV associated tumors uh, used a, um, a special kind of PET scan. And so based on the level of oxygen seen in the tumor, um, if, if they had um, a normal oxygen level, then they could actually have only three weeks of radiation therapy. And in this group, um, they actually, their outcomes were very excellent um, uh, when combined with chemotherapy and very similar to um, what we'd expect to see with patients who are getting much higher doses. So I do think that's quite an exciting um, de-intensification de of these treatments. And it has to be studied in a bigger trial, but I think if we can really get down the dose, that will lead to less toxicity, better long-term quality of life. Um, 
And then, you know, I think more on a human level, when I talk with patients, it's very much about, we have a lot of data um, and how to synthesize that data is still difficult, but it does come down to patients' goals and values. And some patients want to be very aggressive because they're feeling well, or they're young and they just want to do it all. And others have maybe other medical problems that they're concerned about or just maybe want less treatment. And I think at the end of the day, um, while we want to cure all of our patients, and that's always our goal, I think some patients really value that quality of life metric and are willing to take less therapy um, and and still feel good that they're going to have some really good outcomes. That's great. Well, thank you for joining for this uh, segment on uh, HPV-driven curable head and neck cancer.